Tonight, the highly mutated JN1 strain of COVID-19 has now reached almost every corner of the nation. But it does look like the holiday surge of cases may be subsiding. We will review the latest data. Many of us have been infected with COVID-19 many times, but with the passage of time, science has been afforded the chance for validation. We're going to review new research on the most effective antivirals for treating COVID and some promising data on the duration and intensity of long COVID symptoms. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And a little bit later on, joining us tonight is Dr. Daniel Anderson, who serves as the Director of the Nebraska Cardiovascular Biobank and Registry. We're going to tell you why that's so important. Dr. Gold, Thank you for joining us this evening. I know our viewers are looking forward to your updates and the opportunity to ask their questions live on the air. What data would you like to begin with tonight? Well, thank you, Christina. And as you said, uh, the news tonight is actually some of the best news we've shared with the audience uh, in a long time. Uh, granted, you know, one tree does not a forest make, so to speak. But nonetheless, uh, we're able to share some really good news tonight. So let's get right into the graphics and show our audience why I feel so optimistic about the trends. So if we look at daily hospitalization in, in the U.S., we're down a little bit to 5,755. Uh, you can see that Delaware, Missouri, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, and Pennsylvania are, are still uh, anywhere from uh, twice to uh, uh, even uh, four times uh, that average, but still small numbers. And when you look at the map, uh, there are a couple of hot spots in the mid-Atlantic. There are some in the northeast, uh, even down in the tip of uh, Texas, uh, southern Florida. But for the most part, the country is looking uh, mostly pale yellow uh, to gray, indicating uh, a fairly low uh, number of hospitalizations. If we look at the trend going back to the very beginning of the pandemic of weekly hospitalizations, uh, hospital admissions, you can see that the numbers uh, are falling uh, and, and, and falling significantly. As a matter of fact, uh, when we look at it by age, uh, you can see that the overall 14-day running average is actually down 23% which is a substantial change to the run-up that we saw during the winter holidays and immediately after the winter holidays in January. Particularly, you know, if you look at that very top curve, you see the 70-year-old and older age group uh, has had the largest fall-off, but even the 60 to 69 and even the under 60-year age group, uh, the youngest uh, in our country, uh, are going down uh, in, in a significant way. And so this is a really positive news that some of the impact of the holiday gatherings and travel, et cetera, have started to wear off. And we're starting to see that change in long-term care facilities uh, and in other conjugate living settings, which has had a significant change in hospital admission uh, data uh, across the country. Now, if we look at the relationship of test positivity to hospitalization, you can again see in the last several weeks from the dotted portion of the amber line uh, to your far right uh, that the number of the test positivity has really come almost back down to baseline uh, as to where it was uh, a year ago, and it's falling quite rapidly. Indeed, it's falling even faster than the hospitalization rate does. Now, Granted, this is a little bit of a lagging indicator, uh, but again, these are all just PCR positive tests in hospitals and clinics, but the methodology has remained the same at least for the past several years, and so there's reason to be very hopeful that as test positivity falls, that's a good predictor of hospitalization and death. And as you said, Christina, in your opening remarks, the JN1 subtype is now just over 93% of all of the virus uh, that we see across the United States uh, based on the so-called NowCast model that we've been using now for a couple of years with our audience. And when we look at the U.S. map, uh, as again you've pointed out so accurately, in almost every corner of the country, the bright purple, the JN1 subtype, uh, represents the overwhelming majority, well over 90 percent or higher, uh, other than perhaps slightly less in the Great Lakes region. And what that means is that there's not been another subtype of the Omicron uh, variant 
that has outcompeted the JN1 subtype. And again, highly transmissible, very short period of time between uh, exposure and symptoms, but really severity not much worse than what we've seen for the last year or so, and still very, very importantly, susceptible to our antivirals, which we'll talk about in a minute, and susceptible to being prevented in severity uh, by our current vaccine. So good news there uh, as well, given how prevalent it is. And when we shift gears a little bit and we start to look at the wastewater map of the United States, again, uh, total sites <clears throat> with current data, just under 1,200, literally reporting uh, coast to coast. Uh, you can see that the red and amber, uh, which are the highest levels, are down 12% and 14% respectively, with the largest change uh, in the 0 to 19%, which is the, uh, the lowest category uh, in the bright blue. And while there is still bright red and amber areas in <clears throat> southern Texas, uh, in the Bay Area, in California, uh, a moderate amount uh, in uh, <clears throat> Wisconsin uh, and Minnesota, uh, some in the uh, Great Lakes region and in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, but nonetheless, uh, overall, the numbers are falling. And again, the wastewater numbers are very predictive of test positivity, hospitalization, and of course, uh, death. And when we look at this long-term trend going back for the last 12 months uh, in wastewater uh, test positivity, you can see the bright red and the amber are well down over the last several weeks since uh, mid to late <clears throat> December uh, following the holiday break. Uh, the blue is increasing, uh, and even the yellow, which is in the moderate range, uh, is uh, somewhat down. So again, <clears throat> we follow this week to week and literally day to day, but uh, the trends uh, do appear to be moving uh, in, the, uh, in the right direction. So when we shift to looking at COVID mortality, uh, the gray bars do seem to show a fall off. However, it is the blue that really counts because those are the confirmed deaths in the United States. And so from COVID alone, we are still seeing the death rate uh, rising uh, as a relate to the holiday season and travel. Now, it wouldn't be surprising, of course, with test positivity falling, hospitalization rates falling, uh, that in the near future we'll start to see case fatality rates and mortality rates falling because the death is clearly the most lagging indicator uh, that we follow. And so we're still, unfortunately, uh, seeing the impact of the holiday season and all of that travel. But when we look at some of the other parameters, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, the combined uh, impact of influenza, RSV, and other viral pneumonias uh, in the chart that you can see on your right, uh, you can see we're past a peak and that it's starting to come down, which means that although COVID is still high, RSV is down uh, and influenza is somewhat down as well. As a matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> last week uh, there were 2,200 uh, COVID deaths in the United States, or 0.7 uh, per 100,000. West Virginia, Oklahoma, Kentucky, New Hampshire, and Indiana are still somewhat above average. But notice that these are all double-digit numbers. So that, that's a very, very big change uh, over uh, a period of time. And hopefully that will continue to fall. Uh, you know, this chart has become one of my favorites now as we get to look at the weekly death rate uh, compared to the hospitalization rate. So as you can see here in the blue, you're looking at the hospitalization rate since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and in the amber waving line, you can see the weekly death rate uh, per 100,000. And again, <clears throat> making the point that while hospitalization went way up uh, considerably over the last post-holiday season, and hopefully it is falling now, the death rate did not follow that. And that is because our antivirals uh, are much better. We're much better at early detection of the disease. And again, our hospitalization outcomes have markedly improved, uh, even in uh, other, even in the most advanced uh, age groups. So when we look at the overall death rates uh, in the United States, we're still hovering under 1.2 million, and it, it's flattened out a good deal <clears throat> due to better treatment, earlier diagnosis, 
uh, et cetera. That's not to say there still aren't people losing their life in the battle with COVID, but well down. So as you said, there are a couple of highlights that I wanted to bring to you uh, this evening. One is from the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. And uh, this journal looked at the uh, impact of several of the uh, oral and intravenous drugs that are available for the treatment of COVID. And without reading to you a 30-page article, uh, what it basically says is that even in the JN1 subtype variant, all of these agents are effective. Now, while they don't produce immediate cures, they certainly markedly reduce the severity of the illness, particularly in older and more vulnerable adults. Uh, again, very good news uh, as it relates to the efficacy of all of these uh, widely available uh, oral and, and intravenous antiviral agents. Uh, another uh, recent article from the Forum of Infectious Diseases uh, reported uh, that individuals who were vaccinated against COVID at any time, but more recently the better, <clears throat> had a lower prevalence of long COVID and had reduced symptom severity than unvaccinated uh, individuals. And so they had less long COVID <clears throat> and those that had long COVID had less severe symptoms. And so for all of those reasons, still a lot of interest in recommending vaccination uh, to individuals uh, and to make sure that they stay current on their vaccination uh, recommendations. And this is a <clears throat> graphic uh, that was part of that publication, and it compares uh, COVID mortality uh, in October of 2021 to COVID mortality uh, in uh, April of 2023, you know, uh, almost a year ago, uh, <clears throat> early on, a very different subtype and a very different set of variants and a very different scale. Notice the graph on the left goes up to 700 cases per million, whereas the graph on the right goes up to 70, one-tenth of that cases per million. But I think what these authors were trying to depict in the gray, you see the older age groups in the blue. You see 65 to 79. Uh, in the amber, you see 50 to uh, 64. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the black, you see 30 to 49-year-old age groups. And this compares vaccinated to unvaccinated individuals, uh, you know, in 2021 and in 2023. And it just makes the point that just in pure case fatality rates, not looking at long COVID, not looking at other severity of symptoms, hospitalization, et cetera, but just looking at death, there is no question that these current vaccines definitely reduce uh, death rates in all age groups. And particularly interestingly, in the 65 to 79 age group, now we know that it reduces significantly in the much older age groups than that, but even in the 30 to 49 year olds and in the 50 to 64 year olds, a significant fall off in mortality as recently as last April, and I'm sure that's still true today. So again, another powerful <clears throat> reason to continue to recommend uh, these vaccines. Uh, this is also a, a study that was just published in, in JAMA uh, and uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And uh, it just reinforces the fact that maternal COVID vaccination is tied to lower risk infection in newborn infants. And this study went on for six months of newborn infant life, but only if administered in the antenatal period. And the antenatal period is typically during the third and last trimester prior to delivery. So again, we have a lot of moms uh, that are getting vaccinated. There are some that are wondering about whether they should or shouldn't. <clears throat> but this just makes the point that if they're uh, vaccinated during the last trimester of their pregnancy, they are protecting uh, their newborns from COVID for a solid six months, and substantially so, as published in uh, you know one of the most prestigious journals uh, that we have. And of course, we've published other work, uh, we've shared other work that was published that said that this reduces uh, morbidity and mortality uh, in the moms as well uh, as a result of vaccination. So a couple of other very promising uh, things I thought I would share. This was also a journal of the American Medical Association uh, publication. 
And this says that for individuals that lost their sense of taste and smell, that a significant percentage of them, and this was a relatively small study uh, done in Italy, 88 patients, uh, and it made the point that a significant percentage of them recovered most or all by the three-year point. And again, you know, for those individuals that may have lost some uh, sense of taste and smell, which is one of the more common long COVID symptoms associated uh, with the disease, it's uh, nice to know that over time it does seem to recover. And that is actually in the context of a much larger study. Uh, this one was published in The Lancet, which is another very uh, prestigious medical journal. And what it says is that most individuals who had long COVID, uh, by the time they get to the three-year mark, uh, whether it's lung function or, or any of the other more typical symptoms, shortness of breath, fatigue, etc., even those symptoms by three years seem to be mild to moderate, even if they were severe earlier on. So again, <clears throat> very positive data uh, on the fact that these changes that we're seeing in long COVID uh, probably in most people, particularly those that don't have other medical illnesses, are, do not appear to last uh, forever, even though we don't have a 100% understanding of what's causing these long COVID uh, symptoms. And then I just wanted to share with you uh, this rather sobering uh, report from the American Cancer Society. And I guess uh, I shouldn't be surprised, but I certainly am disappointed that the projected number of new diagnoses of cancer has now exceeded 2 million a year for the very, very first time. And if you look at the 10 most frequent cancers that we see, 6 out of 10 are actually up. And the interesting finding also is that colorectal cancer, new cases, has shifted mortality patterns in adults younger than 50 and has now moved up from the fourth leading cause of cancer death to the first leading cause of cancer death in men less than 50 and the second in women. Now, we're doing much better in different types of skin cancer. We're doing much better <clears throat> in breast cancer, which where our screening programs are extremely effective. And colorectal cancer, uh, with all types of testing and screening modalities, uh, can be identified at a very early, very treatable age and at a stage that it does not necessarily need to lead to death. And so it's kind of disappointing that, uh, that we're seeing this shift in cancer mortality uh, across the United States. And again, two million first-time diagnosed cases. You know, arguably, we should be screening more and doing better with screening. There may have been some latency in the screening due to the onset of COVID. But for all of those reasons, we have exceeded uh, 2 million uh, new deaths and, a, and an uptick in 6 out of 10 of our top cancers. So I guess my message to our audience tonight is uh, once more that the COVID vaccines are around. They're effective. They're particularly effective in the last trimester of pregnancy for both moms and newborns. And that effect lasts at least uh, six months. Individuals with chronic diseases, be they liver disease, uh, transplants, and so many others, uh, are particularly benefited from our vaccines. Uh, and as, of course, as we all know, that it, individuals who are immunocompromised, either on medications such as high-dose steroids and others, have lesser effect from the vaccines, more severe COVID, but we are still strongly recommending that those individuals get vaccinated. So uh, for those in the audience that have questions, if you fall into a high-risk category, or if you're uncertain, please reach out to your local health care professional. Ask them uh, what they recommend for you. You know, as I say, week after week, all health care is local. Uh, please talk to the people that know you and your health care uh, the very best. And so with that, Christina, back to you. I very much look forward to discussions with our guests this evening and, of course, most of all, to our audience interaction and our questions. Absolutely. You at home, you're such a big part of this show. We want to hear from you tonight. The number is 877-731-6733. And Dr. Gold, I'm excited to delve into tonight's topic because it is so important. We're going to talk about heart disease tonight and ways that you can prevent it. We're going to talk about why it's so important to stay focused on this in rural America. 
And I want to bring something up before we get there. I always spend a little time with you asking my questions. Something that we keep hearing about measles. Do you have an update for us on the spread of measles that you've been talking about for the past couple weeks? Yeah, so, you know, Christina, I was really tempted to put an update into the graphics this evening, but I was wanting to reserve as much time as possible for Dr. Anderson. But let me just say that we've been following this very carefully. The numbers are rising, particularly in Europe. The hospitalization rates are up, and they're up by, you know, it's not that they're up by twofold or sixfold or eightfold. They're up by a lot more than that. And this relates to vaccine hesitancy uh, in families, particularly with school-aged children. And, you know, when these young children are getting hospitalized with measles, regrettably, uh, an unfortunate number of them are actually losing their life because measles can be an extremely severe disease. You know, uh, we came pretty close to obliterating measles uh, in most parts of the United States and in, in certainly uh, fully developed westernized countries, as we say. And now we're seeing just the opposite with vaccine hesitancy. You know, most of our school systems have vaccine requirements for our kiddos, but they do have to waive them and they should waive them for medical reasons uh, and for religious preferences. But, you know, that, that should be a very small percentage of the number of kids because the overwhelming majority of kids uh, should be eligible to be fully vaxxed. And, you know, as uh, shared with my audience uh, many times on this broadcast, I have a pair of twin grandchildren, a little boy and a little girl. And let's say uh, their parents uh, have done what was highly recommended by their pediatrician uh, is to get their kiddos fully vaccinated and to keep them completely up to date. They, by the way, uh, said repetitively, uh, Grandpa, I want to be first in line for when the COVID vaccines came out. And that was really good until they were first in line. <laughs> and, uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, they were there and uh, they're fully vaxxed for COVID also. Good, I hope they got a lollipop to ease a little bit of the, uh, the nerves that comes with getting a shot as they a got, They got more than one. Okay, good thing. <laughs> you deserve an extra one in that instance. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really important to our audience. We run the gamut on this show. We talk about everything, especially those stories that are making news. Before we go to break, I want to open up the phone lines to you, 877-731-6733. Tonight, like we talked about, Dr. Gold brought another fantastic expert along. We're going to spend some time talking about the number one killer of both men and women. It's heart disease and the ways that you can prevent it. Call in with your questions now, 877-731-6733. When we come back... Dr. Daniel Anderson, fan favorite, will join our conversation. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters after this. It's raining. It's pouring. During bad weather, driving can become downright dangerous. So the next time a storm is coming, trust Battle Vision Storm, the revolutionary glare reduction glasses that turn your sight bright during bad weather at night or during the day. Watch your ordinary vision become extraordinary. Wow, it's so it's so clear. It's dusk, but I can really see. Oh, wow. Honestly, for how dark it is out here right now, these are incredible. Battle Vision Storm uses light-optimizing lenses that block blue rays, so you see clearly in heavy rain at night or blinding snow during the day. Heavy rain, snow, sleet, or fog can make it impossible to drive. Not with Battle Vision Storm. And they're not just for storms. They turn night to bright, even in perfect weather. I used to hate driving at night. The traffic lines were hard to see. The lights from oncoming traffic were blinding. I feel so much safer driving in the evenings now. Blinding sunlight or headlights cut the glare instantly. Dark traffic signs? See them with confidence. Blurry lane markers? Turn clear and visible. Wow! Even objects in your side and rear view mirrors are easier to see. And Battle Vision Storm go head to head with the toughest conditions. Whether you're driving through smoke filled air from wildfires, or you're on a boat getting crushed by the sea, and they're guaranteed for life. Get your Battle Vision Storm for only $19.99. But wait, due to rising costs and supply chain shortages, this may be your last chance to get your very own Battle Vision Storm at this low price. There is a strict limit of four Battle Vision Storm per order while supplies last. Don't wait. Order now. 
Call 1-800-514-8411. That's 1-800-514-8411. Or visit BattleVisionStorm.com. So call 1-800-514-8411 now. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome Dr. Daniel Anderson, the Director of the Nebraska Cardiovascular Biobank and Registry and former Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at UNMC. During the pandemic, he studied how COVID-19 infections impacted the heart and cardiovascular system overall. He is a wealth of information and he's become one of our regular guests here on Rural Health Matters. Welcome back, Dr. Anderson. We hear a lot about cancer, and deservedly so. But some out there might still be surprised to find out that the leading cause of death in this country is actually heart disease. Should we, as a society, therefore, be thinking more about heart and the cardiovascular system as a whole? I, thank you. It is truly a pleasure to be here once again. And, and I think you're exactly right. But we, we can't forget that cancer is is a huge risk factor. But I think we have to make sure we keep uh, eyes on both of those aspects. Um, and heart disease still prevails, as you mentioned. And there's there are absolute ways which we, together with your providers and um, colleagues and, and specialists, take care of problems that lead to these things. And and in some ways, you know, we've learned through COVID that the people who are at the greatest risk for COVID were the ones who had heart disease. So I think you can look at heart disease as preventing other problems in the future as well. And and there's a there's a relationship there that comes together. Well, there's a reason why we have you on American Heart Month. What do you most want our audience at home to know about tonight that maybe some of us haven't thought much about lately? Well, I, I think the American Heart Month is really to bring awareness to heart and stroke. It's it's really about heart attacks and strokes, uh, making sure we're thinking about ways in which we can protect ourselves, educating the community uh, so that we reevaluate ourselves. Um, and I think as an example, you know, is I, I tell patients all the time, and if you're in your 50s and 60s, you should constantly revisit with your provider about your heart health on an annual basis, if not even more frequent, depending on the medical problems you have. So it's just about renewing that effort to make sure we're doing the right things because life is busy, life goes fast, and before you know it, you haven't seen your provider for a couple years, and that's a lost opportunity. It's so important. I mean, it's the reason why every time you go in, even for a routine checkup, they are checking your heart rate. It is so important. And we're going to have this discussion tonight. We want to invite you in on it. 877-731-6733. Philip of Ohio joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Philip. Go right ahead. Yeah, this question is for uh, Dr. Gold and about the COVID. Uh, Shortly after Pfizer and Moderna come out with their vaccines. They had an article on TV where the Army had came out with a vaccine that was COVID vaccine that was supposed to take care of all strains of COVID. And he said it was in the research stage. And I just wonder what ever happened to that, because I only heard that one story on it, and that was all I heard. Well, thank you for calling, Philip, and uh, I'll tell you what I know about that, and I can do a little bit more research uh, before our next broadcast, which I'm always willing to do. So uh, the military embraced the same series of vaccine products uh, that uh, were available to the civilian populations uh, in the United States, predominantly the, uh, the, you know, uh, the Pfizer uh, and the Moderna uh, mRNA vaccines, uh, the Novavax product was rolled out there as well, and including the boosters that we, we currently have. At the same time, uh, there have been uh, new vaccines that are being developed that are less specific to one subtype of COVID than another. You know, every time we talk about JN1 or we talk about XBB, or we talk, or originally talked about you know, Delta variant and, and others, uh, they're significantly genetically different. The proteins on the surface of the, vac- of the virus look different, and therefore the vaccine lock and key mechanism has to be different as well. And so the thought was, if you could develop vaccines that identified 
and locked on to multiple sites of the virus, not just the spike proteins, but multiple sites of the virus, you could have more effective and more uh, variant independent vaccines. And there's been a lot of work done on that. So I'm not aware of any that are currently widely commercially available uh, in the United States. I mean, I'm aware of some that we've participated in some research projects uh, to look at so-called multivalent uh, vaccines, mm -hmm. uh, not multivalent in the sense of multiple variants, but multivalent in the sense of, of specific antibody activity against the spike protein, various uh, capsule proteins, and other parts of the uh, COVID virus. But, you know, as we've got an expert on the line with us tonight with Dr. Anderson. I wonder, uh, Dan, whether you have any other uh, recollection of anything in the literature or anything that you've experienced uh, about a more what I would call universal vaccine. And I should say, you know, uh, to our audience tonight as well, that that exact same kind of research is going on mm -hmm. with the flu, with influenza, to try to create a single influenza vaccine that would not require an annual revaccination cycle. But uh, Dan, do you have any thoughts or any insight into that other than what my limited recollection is? Yeah, I, I do think there has been a number of studies out there that show, as you described, that the virus mutates so quickly that a lot of the epitopes that, or the proteins and the sites on the proteins that the immune system responds to changes. And it changes because the pressure of our immune system. So our immune system will suppress or an antibody will bind to a specific part of a protein and prevent it from replicating. So what, what that allows is other viruses that have already mutated in the body to amplify themselves because that antibody is not gonna work for that. So while the multivalent I think is a, is a great example, it kind of mimics what your body does when you have a viral infection. You create antibodies to lots of different parts of the proteins. But the virus, we have to remember, is really quick at adapting to that and, and escaping that immune response. Um, and I think that's what we've shown in the literature. So it is about constantly reassessing what the current strain is, what the nature of the proteins are that do respond or have an immune response, and making sure we match that because that's what changes quite quickly. Um, some of the other proteins don't change, but that, those are often essential proteins for viral replication, and they're not exposed to the immune system as a particle. So what we really are looking for is how does the immune system attack a particle that's circulating in the bloodstream or in the different fluids of tissue before it binds to a cell, gets in a cell, infects a cell, and damages that cell? So it's, it's a great question, and, and that's the challenge that's been out there with Coxsackie, or coronavirus, I, I said my virus I studied as a PhD student, Coxsackie virus, very similar. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge with these kind of RNA viruses. Thank you so much for that call, Philip. And what an insightful response from both of you tonight. Jim from Pennsylvania joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Jim. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, back in 69, we had a lecture uh, by a guy you kids might have uh, heard of. Uh, Michael the Bakey. I uh, don't remember much about what he said, just uh, pulling uh, all kinds of Dacron lotteries out of his pockets for uh, comic relief. I don't know whether he got to see the equine uh, cardiovascular center at uh, Tuskegee uh, Moton Field, where the Tuskegee Airmen uh, learned to fly out of. Uh, just we had to get back to class. Uh, question for tonight. Uh, is is there um, <clears throat> any new uh, treatment for arrhythmiogenic uh, right ventricular cardiomyopathy? So that's a really good question for uh, Dr. Anderson. And, you know, uh, let's just set the stage for that a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. As cardiovascular diagnosis is getting better and better, we can separate out the diseases that affect the right side of the heart and the left side of the heart. And sometimes they're quite different and therefore they have different treatments. And so what Jim is asking about is what is available for right-sided failure as opposed to left-sided heart failure. And, there, and maybe, Dan, you take a minute just to describe the difference and then also talk a little bit about the treatment. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a spectacular question because we do think about the left and the right heart, as Dr. Gold mentioned, in a different fashion and form. 
Um, and I think that for ARVD or uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, as you mentioned, you know, that, that is an abnormality of infiltration and replacement of muscle tissue with fatty tissue. And as you can imagine, fatty tissue doesn't behave like true cardiac tissue. And it is isolated to the right ventricle. Um, sometimes we don't know exactly why that is. Is it with the hemodynamics, for example, the the lower pressure but thinner walls? Is it is it the, the stress of the contraction? And the genetics clearly play into that as well as what's the susceptibility to develop it. Um, and so we don't have a treatment for ARVD at this point in time. Um, there are some other uh, aspects of genetic abnormalities that we can manage and treat. And we can talk about that at this point or even at a later time. But I do think that with that, we really are looking at supportive, uh, making sure that the heart function remains as viable as possible with good medical management. And you can really preserve that heart function if you're aggressive with treating and unloading that ventricle and making sure it doesn't work or have to work too much because that's an extra stress and a strain that facilitates that remodeling and that change. Um, otherwise, we're looking at cardiac transplantation and there's some efforts underway to increase the, the number of transplants as well. Um, so I think that there has been advances at each of those steps that really make a difference in treating patients in our population, you know, whether it's in Nebraska here or all across the world. You know, I'd like to ask you about transplant success and how far we've come in that department a little bit later on in the show, but we're getting so many great calls tonight. 877-731-6733. Todd from Florida joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Todd. Go right ahead. Good evening. How are you tonight? I, my question is twofold, both for the cardiologist and the uh, Dr. Gold. My concern is, is that there's a lot of statistical information and why people are apprehensive in taking the vaccine due to myocarditis, the clotting effect, uh, early onset of cancer that's become more aggressive. So what kind of statistics do you have about the side effects of the vaccine? And then for Dr. Anderson, my concern in heart disease is most doctors don't recommend the tests that truly tell you the current health of your heart and your blood vessels. The only true test to know what's going on with your heart is a catheter or a CT angiogram with dye. And most mm -hmm. cardiologists avoid that test and don't recommend that test when it's the only true way to know. And you see people dying of heart attacks, they'll do a stress test and unless they're 70 or 80 percent blockage, they don't do a stent. So early preparation on heart disease to start out at a young age to know the condition of your heart is very important and to mm -hmm. do those tests. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, Todd, I'll take the first part and I'll uh, let Dr. Anderson uh, deal with the second and uh, he, that's right in his wheelhouse. And he has, I'm sure, a lot of knowledge about the uh, impact of vaccines and COVID uh, on heart function, uh, inflammation changes, uh, blood clotting, et cetera. So the long and the short of it, Todd, is that any agent, any vaccine doesn't make any difference whether it's influenza, whether it's measles, mumps, rubella, uh, shingles, anything that causes your immune system to become activated, which is what you really want to do. You want to raise your immune system activity has a small but definite risk of getting too much activity of your immune system, which is what results in the very small incidence of what we call myocarditis uh, mm. and some of the consequences of that, seen most commonly in younger men. Uh, but having mm. said all of that, the incidence of that is far, far, far lower than the cardiac consequences of getting COVID by a order of maybe 10,000 less chances of, of that. And indeed, in almost all of the instances of even if there is mild uh, cardiovascular inflammation that, that is seen either in blood vessels themselves or in the heart muscle, it's my understanding that it tends to be extremely mild and it tends to be very short-lived even without treatment. And there is good treatment for it. 
That's not to say there's not a rare case that occurs that is severe or that has uh, consequences to it. That's not to say there's not another rare case uh, due to changes in blood clotting and things of that nature uh, due to uh, vaccine administration as well. But the number of lives that have been saved in this country alone by administering uh, hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines, are, 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 it is impossible to count how many lives have been saved. Because if you look at what's happened in other parts of the developing world and in other parts of the world that had less effective vaccines, the complication rates of COVID and the death rates of COVID were just uh, off the charts. And so uh, I, I appreciate your question. You know, we are all unfortunately aware of the rare case, the member of our church or our community or our school system who has had a reaction to the vaccine and everybody says, you know, I told you so, this was going to happen, etc. But what you don't hear about are all the people that are vaccinated who are, you know, living a full life, are, are not sick, are not hospitalized and have not lost their life uh, battle uh, with one of these infectious diseases. Now, the question about cardiac catheterization and CT angiography that is a very, very, very different question as to what is uh, the most appropriate test to diagnose heart disease. And uh, before I turn it over to Dr. Anderson, I would say it all depends on what you're looking for, mm -hmm. meaning how old the patient is, uh, what their risk factors are, what their symptoms are, et cetera. So if you're looking for coronary artery disease, you're looking in one direction. If you're looking for uh, weakness of function of the heart muscle, you're looking in another direction. And so, Dr. Anderson, uh, how would you answer our, our caller's really good questions about the best tests for heart disease? Well, I, I think that's an outstanding question. And I think that Dr. Gold's right in that when I see somebody in my clinic that has symptoms that are consistent with coronary disease, and you try to decide, how do I take care of this patient? Because uh, to, to flip side this, what we don't want to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is a heart cath on a patient because there's significant complications that come from doing that heart cath. You know, we put catheters in the heart and you're right, we can see the narrowing in the arteries, we can measure the resistance and the flow across a narrowing in that artery, and we can decide with very good data what we should put a stent in and what we should treat medically. And it is the gold standard. But we also see putting that catheter in those arteries can disrupt the vessel and people die instantly on the table. So it's not trivial to consider doing a cardiac catheterization. While it's routine and it's necessary, we've designed the tests that help us understand who should we do this with? Who should we accept that risk of that complication? And that's where the stress tests come in that you've, you've delineated. You know, there's a, a handful of stress tests, whether it's a, a stress echo or an exercise echo or the nuclear study or the CT angiogram that we can do that helps us understand, is there blockages? If there's none, we don't need to do anything. If there is blockages or there's an indication of a blockage, then we have to say it's worth the risk to do the heart cath to get that. So those tests are really kind of staging so that we do the right thing and not cause problems, but, but are very good at identifying those who do have problems. Now, to your point, nothing is perfect. There's no 100% diagnostic test. So as Dr. Gold mentioned, we really do take into account the patient's symptoms, how they're feeling, what's their clinical progression, their risk factors. You know, is this a likely problem? <clears throat> how do we manage that? Um, and and that's, that's, a, that's a, a complex decision to make, and it, it's made with the patient often, and it should be, to say, here's what the options are, here's what we could do. Um, and I, I think that's a kind of a high level uh, overview of how we think about managing patients in clinic, but it's an, it's an important strategy and, and it's worth discussing and asking that question with your provider. I'll say that's a high level overview. I just love being able to have a seat at the table for this conversation. I love the fact that the questions that we get are all over the spectrum and we always get such sound science-based, data-driven, factual information from the doctors who come on this show. I, it's really nice to have a seat at this table. Maybe you want to join us tonight, 877-731-6733. Calvin is doing so from South Dakota tonight. Thanks for joining us, Calvin. Go right ahead. Calvin Heitzman here from uh, uh, just uh, from, from Sioux Falls. 
And my question tonight was, what is the real uh, term plasma of the COVID thing? Was COVID changed from Corona? Well, Calvin, you know, uh, we're still uh, dealing uh, with uh, a SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, what has changed is a number of mutations in the various proteins. And the reason it has changed so much is that these viruses uh, have a way of surviving. You know, the, there's an old saying in, uh, in medical school that the bacteria and the viruses uh, and the fungi are going to outlive all of us uh, someday. And, uh, and that is because they are so adaptable to change mm -hmm. and to survival. And that's what we've seen uh, over the years uh, since, you know, it's hard to believe uh, it was uh, January of 2020 that we first diagnosed COVID-19 uh, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and, uh, and we've seen many, many different variants of it. But the same basic RNA viral particle is still what we're dealing with. Yes, some of the surface proteins, particularly the spike proteins, have changed and they've changed substantially. Uh, the JN1 variant has, you know, quite a few new mutations compared to some of the older uh, subtypes of the Omicron variant. But, however, the same basic germ particle that we're dealing with uh, has not changed. It is still a novel coronavirus. Excellent. Thank you so much for that call, Calvin. We appreciate it. We're going to pause for a quick break, but stay with us. More time for your calls on the other side of this break, 877-731-6733. And he made it through tonight. We're going to hear from Russ of New York when we come back with more Rural Health Matters right after this. Clogged gutters can cause big problems fast. Until now, call 833-LEAF-FILTER today for your free gutter inspection. I've had terrible flooding problems on my porch. Now I understand why. Right now, Leaf Filter is offering a free inspection on your schedule. Leaf Filter is a permanent gutter solution, so you never have to worry about costly damage from clogged gutters again. Call us today and schedule your free inspection. To schedule your free inspection, call 833 Leaf Filter today or visit leaffilter.com. Let's Rodeo San Antonio, the second stop on the Texas Swinglands right here in the heart of Texas. This February, catch every performance of the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo on the Cowboy Channel. Let's Rodeo San Antonio. All the history, prestige, and competition is why San Antonio is a 14-time PRCA Large Indoor Rodeo of the Year. Don't miss a moment of the Texas Swing on the Cowboy Channel and streaming on Cowboy Channel Plus. RFD-TV is proud to share the story of agriculture and raise awareness of ag education during National FFA Week. Join us starting February 17th in celebrating your local FFA chapter. We'll look at some of the ways you can support local ag students on Give FFA Day. Show off your FFA pride on social media and tag us. Then tune in and see it all on the Market Day Report, February 17th through the 24th with RFD-TV. One of the biggest challenges my clients face is buying and selling a home at the same time. Many of my clients ask me, Tanya, how can I afford to buy my next home, but also make sure my current home sells? That's why who you work with matters. With Homelight, we're able to help our clients buy and sell at the same time. It's the most game-changing product in real estate today. Together with Homelight, we've helped clients win the home of their dreams. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. We're going to go straight to the phones where Russ joins us of New York tonight. Thanks for joining us, Russ. Go right ahead. Oh, so good to see you, Christina. And to hear Dr. Goldby upbeat about COVID, it's very rare. And thank you both for introducing many of us in New York to RFD and the Cowboy Channel. I was so glad to be able to turn off NBC's, MSNBC's Joanne Reed, who was with the Women of the View today, and instead watch Tammy Arender and Stu the Guy in the Cow Suit on Market Day Report. I just just wish the rest of Dish TV viewers knew of your great product. But I have a question for Dr. Gold. You know, in New York, school attendance is down 40%. And it occurred to me but what Dr. Gold was saying is that maybe some of them are parents who won't vax the kiddos and are just keeping them home. 
Dr. Gold, would you support an amnesty for parents who are afraid of the vax and educating them when the kids got back to school? And Dr. Anderson, a quick question for you is after that, Dr. Todd's comment about the catheter and the dye job, I feel kind of dumb asking this question, but I try and take my blood pressure. I was just wondering, are there any heart devices that we could use at home, you know, or, you know, maybe this is dumb, but that thing that they have in congregate settings where they give you, like, the medical taser and they zap you, I mean, you couldn't do that to yourself, right? Okay, so thanks very much. Bye. <laughs> well, thanks for calling, Russ, and, uh, you know, there are so many programs uh, across the United States right now to help educate parents of young kiddos uh, about the benefit of vaccines. Uh, the, the best education, however, uh, comes from their local health care provider, typically their pediatrician or the school nurse or somebody uh, that will talk to them uh, about uh, vaccines and about access to school. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, medical exemptions and religious exemptions are still certainly possible and very appropriate when, when used in the right way. But the majority of those parents that are reluctant to get their kiddos uh, vaccinated these days uh, really connect their concerns about COVID vaccines uh, with uh, concerns about measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, uh, and so many others that are polio, for instance, that are really, really critical. Uh, you know, we've done a really good job of nearly obliterating those diseases and driving hospitalization rates to almost zero in those categories in our nation. And now we're just starting to see an uptick. So, you know, uh, I think the, the best way to deal with vaccine hesitancy, as you say, Russ, is just to talk to people, find out where their hesitancy is based and provide them with some fact-based information, which is, you know, one of the reasons that uh, Christina and I and our guests get together every Monday night and do this broadcast is just to try to share the science uh, with folks as to what the risks and benefits are and how uh, to help them make the best decision for themselves uh, and for their uh, families. And I'll let uh, Dr. Anderson take your second question because he's certainly the expert in that field. So I think that's a great question, Russ. I think you're, you're right in that there are a lot of home devices that have been beneficial in helping people manage their cardiovascular disease. And you, and you give an example, a blood pressure monitor cuff at home so you can keep track of that is, is really critically important, especially with somebody we're adjusting medications from. And, you know, we, we refer to hypertension or high blood pressure as the silent killer. Nobody knows it's happening until it's too late. And then the horse is out of the barn for a farm speak. You know, and I, and I think you really have to keep after it. So using those tools, there are some other devices that people use, clearly glucometers, you know, there's digitally uh, uh, linked weights and scales. You know, we have some uh, electrical uh, uh, devices that look at heart rate monitors, whether it's, you know, ones that you put your fingers on or your thumbs on, or you use your watch to do that. And those can all, they, all of those can be very beneficial in helping to understand what your problems are. And we use them quite routinely. So I, I think talk to your provider, understand what they're comfortable with, um, and that's important. And then, you, you know, leverage that uh, to your benefit. Regarding the ability to use a taser on yourself, I presume you're talking about cardioverting yourself out of atrial fib if you are in it. Um, I, I know not from personal experience, but having taken care of a patient with, I'm not going to go into this situation, was cardioverted without anesthesia. I think he used a few expletives and then said, never again. <laughs> Thank you for that true life story. We appreciate that yeah. so much. The transparency that comes from the doctors. And we get some of the best. We do. We get the world's best doctors on this program. I mean, last week we had Dr. Burton Yoli, the director of the NIH with us. And I understand that the NIH recently awarded UNMC's heart program nearly $12 million dollars to create a center of excellence in heart research. What are you going to do with that funding? And what are some of the exciting things that you're working on in Nebraska right now? Dr. Gold, let's start with you and then Dr. Anderson, take it away. Well, you know, uh, first of all, <clears throat> uh, it was great to have uh, Monica Bertoglioni uh, on a broadcast uh, last week and uh, UNMC uh, and uh, <clears throat> University of Nebraska uh, receives a lot of federal research dollars every year. But this particular piece is uh, huge for us. 
and really just adds to our expertise in research in cardiovascular disease. So, Dr. Anderson, maybe you can give us a little explanation of what that's going to do and what we hope to achieve with that research. So I think this was a spectacular success for the, our, our healthcare system, and you know it's a privilege to receive this award from the NIH. And I think hats off to the team and Dr. Rebecca Gundry, who really was led this uh, whole effort. Um, you know, this award is really about you know uh, an award that is a mark of success and excellence. So I think it speaks to what Dr. Gold said: is the university system is is in a stage and a platform that we can really continue to build our research programs, our infrastructure, and what I mean by that is the tools and the resources that we make available to everybody. So the Center for Heart and Vascular Research is a, is a collection of all the different investigators within the university system. And that's not just UNMC, but UNO, University of Omaha, and Kearney, and at Lincoln. It's Nebraska's educational system that are part of the Center for Heart and Vascular Research. And it's really about bringing forward and, 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 and elevating that program. I think the real money is spent on our, our younger faculty members who interact with our senior faculty members who are very experienced and really serve a mentorship role. Right now we have four individuals who are our pro, pro, uh, program uh, facilitators where they have a research proposal that they work on for three years with the entire team. So seasoned people like Dr. Rebecca Gundry, I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm part of this team and building this program. And that, that what they really have is a three-year criteria, all four of them, with money that's funded at the level of an NIH R01 grant. And what that is, is it's a very targeted, very defined, well-written, well-thought-out program for research studies that answer questions for improving healthcare and delivering healthcare to the clinical bedside. So I think this is a huge value for Nebraska, the Midwest. You know, it'll end up in a published literature that's high impact. Um, I think we're very excited about this, and I think it's it's going to be an amazing way to help build the future of research. You know, that continues well past my years. Mm, and it's happening right in the heart of rural mm -hmm. America, thanks to doctors like both of you. And it's such an important topic that we are having this discussion on tonight. Don't forget, do you want to keep this on the forefront of your mind throughout the month of February? You have to come back. We have to have you back on the show, Dr. Anderson. You're a wealth of information. And, you. and you and Dr. Gold, you play off of each other very well. Dr. Gold used to work on the hearts of babies, in case you didn't know that about him. I want to thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you to our audience. We had a lot of great calls. We didn't get a chance to get to all of them tonight. Remember, you can leave us a voice recording on our hotline. The number is 855-776-6147. We'll see you next week right here on Rural Health Matters.